Okay, good morning. Welcome to day two of the uh, USPS uh, redesign overview. Today we're going to be going over the actual payroll process and we'll also be uh, diving into the payments option as well. So uh, again, if anybody has questions throughout, just go ahead, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions or add it to the chat, whatever you prefer to do, that would be great. And we will go ahead and get started. So um, in order to process a payroll, we have the payroll tab available. Under that payroll tab, if I kind of hover over it and click that down arrow, you'll see we have the, the future and the current options available, as well as the payroll processing option itself. So um, this works similar to classic. If they wanted to go out and they wanted to start adding future records, uh, like time slip uh, information, they can do that. And then what happens is, um, once they do that and they initialize the pay, just like classic, it will pull that future data in. So it's up to the district, however they want to process, you know, how, whatever uh, they want to do as far as like, uh, stop it. <laughs> Sorry, she's already starting. Um, as far as they uh, payroll checklist, how they want to process their payroll. So the first thing we'll go into is the uh, payment, the future payments. I'll just go in here and I'm going to add a future entry. So basically what we have to do is just hit the create button and then you find your employee. You would choose the compensation if, if the default one is the very first compensation that they have out there. Um, if that's not the position you're wanting to pay or the compensation you're wanting to pay, you would choose a dot, the drop down and pick the, the compensation you're wanting to add payment for. So then again, this teacher test that came over on the compensation, remember when we created the, uh, the compensation record, we added that to the label. That is basically pulling from the label field on the compensation record. If we wanted a description on the pay stub, we could add, you know, like maybe a, a teacher test. Oops, I just spell teacher. Maybe it's extra hours. We can add that in there. And then when we do, that will actually process over onto the check stub. So I'm going to go ahead and you got to choose your pay type, which in this case, since this employee is already on a contract that's strike paid throughout the, uh, the, the school year, we want to make sure that we would use the miscellaneous pay type. We don't want to use regular because, again, that would go towards his regular contract, which we do not want to do since this is extra pay. Um, an effective date could be entered in, you know, if, if districts want to go out like they do in Classic now and enter in future data for future payrolls. They could you put in effective dates for the for that. It's not the pay date. It is the actual any day between the period beginning and ending date. It's not the actual pay date. Then they would go ahead and enter in the, the number of units that they work, the rate, how much they're going to be paying that employee, what the rate is. Um, the apply applies for retirement is already defaulted, is already checked. So if for some reason you did not want this payment to go toward retirement, you'd have to uncheck that box. Then obviously you'd have to enter in the retire hours associated with this payment. Why is that doing it? There we go. Um, if this was a supplemental payment, we could check that box. And we could also choose a supplemental taxing option if that was the case. Now, if for some reason I wanted to pay him not out of his regular pay account, but I wanted to charge a different pay account for this extra, the extra hours, the overtime hours. I could go down to this plus box, click on that. And then here it allows me to actually enter in an expenditure account that I, the one that I want to be charged to. So I could, the, the rate type currently defaults to fix. I could use the fix option or I could use a percent option. Then I could, again, find the account, the expenditure account I want to pay him out of. So I would start out 
with um, some of the dimensions of the account. And again, it'll it'll narrow it down the more dimensions I put in. We will just choose this account. And then I'm going to pay him 100% out of this account. Now, do I want to charge lead production and employer distribution? Or to, uh, do I want to charge that to this account? If I don't, I want to make sure that they uh, that I uncheck those boxes. And you'll notice here, we also have a trash can, which basically means if I want to get rid of what I just entered, I could just click on that and that whole line would go away. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save this. And then again, we do have that create new and close feature in, in the future screen as well like we had on some of those other screens that we saw yesterday. You could use that as well. Maybe I'll uh, click on the create new. Maybe I want to add more than one record for him. Mm -hmm. So I've got all the data entered uh, for this, this first payment that I want to have in there. So I go ahead, click the save button. When I click mm -hmm. that, that record is saved. But notice it kept my employee in there. And then it also blanked out all the other fields that I need to populate. Now, if for some reason I don't want this employee, I want a different one, I could go in and choose a different employee if I wanted to. And then use future to pay that employee. So I could go in and keep adding multiple records in future if I wanted to by using that create new option. So now we can see that my, uh, where did it go? My, my uh, payment that I added is out there as a miscellaneous. Now, you'll notice here, there's two of them for him that are set as regular for job one. We really don't want that. So I, sh I have the capability of going in and using modify. And actually, it's just the description that's pulling as regular. The pay type is showing miscellaneous. So I could just go in and change that description to show as miscellaneous. That way we don't, that way it's not showing up as regular. Now the description isn't going to hurt anything as far as when he actually gets paid. Because it said regular wages, that won't go toward his regular job. Now this one being that it says regular pay type, that would, that would go toward his regular, his job. We don't want that. So I'm going to change that to this as well. Go ahead and change that one. Make that change. Okay, now those are all changed, which is a good thing. We want that. These other two, if they're substitutes or whatever, that, that's fine. You could leave them the regular pay for a sub or for a coach or you know someone that has a non-contracted job. You could have regular in there. But now this other entry here for Hernandez, does, that is a regular as well. Shouldn't really be a regular. It should be showing as a, as a miscellaneous. So let me just change that as well. These are probably just entries that I added in. Okay, so I think we got the pay type and everything corrected and how we want future looking. Now, the nice thing is you can actually Pull up on, you know, in your grid, if you want, what fields you want to be on there. You could run a report if you wanted to. If I wanted to sort, I could go ahead and go over to last name and just click on that. It'll sort that alphabetically, ascending or descending. If I, you know, click it again. But if I click, I could click on that and it will actually sort that column for me. Then I could go in and I could actually run a report if I wanted to. So I'll just go ahead here and click on report. I'll just use a PDF version. Send this to my download. I don't want it going somewhere where it shouldn't be. So I'm holding them up there already. So here's my report from the grid. That's my future report from the grid. But 
We also do have under reports, under report manager, we actually do have a future pay report. Let's see if I can find it here, right there it is. Future pay amount report is under SSET future pay amount. So to process that, I just go to this generate and download report option. I'll click on it. I can choose the format. If I didn't want PDF, I wanted some other format, I could process it in that. I have the capability of naming this report. So this is gonna be maybe my 315 payroll. I'll say my, my 31521 future detail report. I'm gonna go ahead and click that generate report option. And when I do that, ooh, that doesn't look so good. <laughs> that is not good at all. Let me go back and try it again. I don't know what happened with that. That's not good. Um, let's try it going one more time. You'll notice here, I might as well talk about the report a little bit. There's report options, which are your formatting, page size, orientation, and naming. And we have a query option. So there are, there's times when maybe you want to put in a date, a like an effective date, beginning effective date, ending effective date, or maybe a particular pay group. And then we also have sort options is available as well. You could sort the report how you wanted to sort. I'm trying to figure out why, oh, I know why. The summary report box is checked. That is not working currently. That's probably the reason it looks so funky, I would bet. We're gonna go ahead and try it again. This time I'm gonna uncheck that summary report. That should make a big difference, I hope. Oh yeah, this is what I wanted to see. Much, much better. Now, one thing you'll no notice here this William Bill Grimes, you'll notice he doesn't have anything under specific pay account, which is true. He's being paid out of his regular pay account. There was no specific pay account added for payment for him. So that's why it's not showing any pay account information for that. But now for Hernandez, we entered specific pay accounts must be for uh, this, this, this job here and this extra hours job we had a specific uh, miscellaneous accounts, as well as this third one, this miscellaneous. So all of those are specific miscellaneous pay accounts. And so we're, they're actually being displayed on the report. These bottom two are being paid out of his regular account. So there's no account associated with a specific miscellaneous pay account on the report. And then you'll notice it's really nice when you use this report because you can see was the applies for retirement boxes checked. What were the employer distribution flags looking like for these specific miscellaneous accounts? Were they checked or unchecked? That shows on this report. It's showing the amount that's going to be charged for the particular account. You'll notice here I did the 100%. These here both show the dollar amount that's being charged for the the uh, the pay, which is like twelve uh, or twelve hundred dollars here, it's showing twelve hundred dollars being charged, and then seven eighty one oh five for this miscellaneous, the seven eighty one oh five is being charged in, from that account. So this report is very helpful. It does give you uh, a gross total at the bottom. Um, it gives you your, the retirement hours that have been entered or entered or you know pulled in one or the other or uh, imported in if you use a CSV file, a spreadsheet. So it is very helpful. It's very similar to classic. Like I said, you can run this report uh, for verification to make sure everything you have in future or want to have in future is out there before you actually initialize your payroll. So once we have all of our data in future, 
we could actually go in at that point and initialize the payroll. Now, a lot of times what districts may do before they start entering anything in, pay, in future at all, they may initialize the payroll just to get their base total. Um, usually what they like to do is balance from pay to pay, make sure their base total matches before they actually start entering future data. And on the report now, the pay report, it does give you future totals. So, I mean, if they want to enter the future data, they can, and then just use, um, you know, the totals on the pay report from future, they can just use that. But um, some districts choose not to, they choose to just initialize it, get a base, get their base, make sure it matches the last payroll. You know, if it doesn't, they need to clear or figure out why. Maybe they had employee that left, isn't getting paid anymore, or maybe they have a payoff they're paying off an employee, um, so it's higher. So they, they usually are able to determine that before they actually start entering future data. But they don't have to anymore if they don't want to since we have those totals on the pay report. But that's just a thought. And like I said, that's just district preference as far as like how they want their checklist set up. So once we've got everything in future, we can actually begin our payroll process. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into payroll, this payroll processing option. Now, to initialize the payroll, I click on this initialize new payroll tab. You'll notice we have an in progress tab and we have a posted. So a posted tab basically shows all of the payrolls that have been processed from you know, whatever you like, whatever you actually import through um, the last pay process. Now, even uh, imported payrolls from Classic will show in here. The only thing with those is you cannot mod, you can't do anything with them. You can look, you can look at the detail on them, but you can't actually go in and like, um, I, I believe like run any reports or anything that were associated with that, but anything that was processed and redesigned, you have the capability of going in. Let's just say I wanted to look at a pay, the pay report from this 2121 payroll. I could click on this detail button. And when I do that, the reports associated with that pay are going to show up here. So I could click on this pay report and actually process the pay report from that particular payroll if I wanted to. Now, you can do that or again, we do have a file archive just like payroll CD and classic where the, the um, report that was processed during the payroll is actually out there, but it does give you the capability of doing that. Or you could actually go in and process payments from that payroll. Maybe you uh, need to process new checks, you could do that, or direct deposits. Maybe you need to process somebody's email notice, you could do that by clicking on the email notice option. Oh, maybe you can't, looks like all of those are gone. So it's possible maybe that person, that pay was a, it was one person, it might've been a, a check. It could have been a physical check, so there are no direct deposits associated with it. Um, but if there were email notices, the, everybody that received a notice during that pay should be showing up. And then you could actually just select that one person. Let me see if I can find a payroll that might have had all the employees. And I could just select one employee. Let's see here. Yeah. This had 183 people. I would assume there were email notices sent out for that. Yeah, here they are. So if I wanted to basically just send one email notice, I could go in and I, first of all, I select the top, I click on the shift button, scroll down, move everybody over to the available, and then I could find the person that I'm looking for that I need to resend pull them over to the selected, and then I could just um, schedule to resend their email notice 
you want, you know, at whenever I want to send it. If I want to send it immediately or tomorrow or whatever, I could do that. Get out of here. All right. So let's go back to the payroll processing. Kind of get waylaid. There's so many things that you can do that I kind of get uh, sidetracked. So we're going to go ahead now and we're going to initialize the payroll, the new payroll. So the first thing that you can do is put in a payroll description. So this is going to be my 315-21 payroll. Pay plan, you have to uh, choose which pay plan it is. And this trick is biweekly, so you can see it already defaulted. The pay cycle, is it the first pay of the month, second pay? Second pay of a three pay or a third pay. We're gonna say it's the first pay. Now, I'm gonna put in the start date. So let's just say I'm using 3-1, the 3-15, Now, let's just do this. If I went in here, remember yesterday I set the, my posted period from March to current, if I use 228.21 as the pay date, and I try to initialize. Oops, it's telling me required data is not valid. And what it's telling me, you'll see that there's a um, exclamation mark right next here. And it, if I hover over it, it says no open posting period for the pay date. I, because I put in February, it's not going to allow me to do it because uh, February is already closed and not current. So that's giving me an error telling me, hey, you can't process the February payroll. Your posting period isn't in February. So if I change this now to 315.21, and if I wanted to, I could select certain pay groups, which I will do. I'm gonna go ahead, again, I wanna get rid of all my pay groups. I wanna put them all over. I wanna put them all over to the available option. And then I'm just gonna pull certain pay groups over. Maybe I have like one pay group that is on a different beginning and ending date schedule, like additions in classic. I can do that here and redesign as well. Um, let's just do, um, I might put this one back over there. Um, yeah, let's just pull this pay, these pay groups in. Now, yeah, I'm pulling these two. All these in. Oops, okay. So I have all of these pay groups pulled in. Hold on for my little experiment here. <laughs> Want to pull that one? There we go. So I've got all of these that are on the same period beginning and ending day of 3 1 21 through 3 15 of 21. I'm going to initialize my payroll. I want to pull in all the pay, all, all of those pay groups into their pay initially. So hopefully I do. Um, when you're initializing, you should get this green button, and then all of your pay groups will reflect the status as being, you know, the green button as well, meaning that they pulled in. Now, I want to use the additions option or the add pay group option because I have one more, one other pay group that I want to include in this pay, but their period beginning and ending dates differ from the 3 1 15 or 3-1 of 21 to 315 of 21. So I can click this add pay group option. And what it will allow me to do is select the pay group or groups that I want to include in the additions. So I'm just going to choose this pay group 20 or yeah, pay group 26. Mm -hmm. But their period beginning date was 215 of 21. 228 of 21. So what I need to do is, like I said, I selected the pay group. I entered in the period beginning and ending dates that are reflective for that pay group. And then I click this add pay group. Now, if you look down here, it's kind of 
not highlighted, but you could see it. When I initialized my payroll, I had 52 employees that were pulled in. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add that pay group 26 using the additions or that addition option. When I do that, right there, you can see now I have 58 employees. So now all of my employees that I want to pay should be included in my initialization of the payroll. At this point, what happens is when you've initialized the payroll, and it is, if you're familiar with classic, it's a little different than classic because in classic, you used to have to run like I and I Cal, health pay. When you're doing the initialization, you're actually doing both processes at once. So once you've initialized the payroll, a pay report actually gets created at that point. So what we can do is if we go out and we, look, we can uh, look at the pay report, you can see here when I click on pay report, I have the capability of going in and maybe I want to say this is a 315-21 payroll report. I can actually do that. I can sort by employee number and there's a lot of different sorting options. I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to sort it by the employee name. But you can see like there was employee name with building, district, check distribution. There's all sorts of sorting options that can be uh, used when running this report. Um, the report format, again, I want it in PDF format, but you do have a capability of choosing Excel or HTML or plain text. I'm just going to use the PDF version. If I wanted to begin each employee on a new page, I can do that by just checking the box. I do want to include the employer amounts, the payroll item amounts, and that is already defaulted, that's checked. If I didn't want it, I would just uncheck it. If I only wanted to re show report totals, I would just click on that box, but I don't want that. I want to show, I want to see everything, all the pay information for all the employees. So I'm going to go ahead and click the generate report. <clears throat> And when I do that, I can then pull the report up and I can see my beginning and ending dates of my pay date, my pay cycle, my pay plan, my pay description that I entered in, whether I chose to suppress voluntary deductions, which I didn't show you when I was initializing, or if I wanted to ignore the direct deposits. I, th those options are available on the initialization. I didn't choose those, so I didn't show them to you. And then here, it's showing me all the different pay groups with the date range selection. So here, we can see all of the different pay groups that pulled in. But then here's my additions pay group. Notice that it has a different period beginning and ending date. And this is really helpful. That way, you know what, uh, what period or what beginning date and ending dates were used for this pay. It tells who reported, who generated the report, and how I wanted it sorted. And then your districts can go in and use the report. They can verify, you know, the retirement, like the SERS days and hours. Uh, they can double check everything. And you'll notice on here, this looks very similar to the pay report in Classic. It's got all the pay information, it's got the pay account information, it has the pay item information, all listed. So um, let's just say, I'm trying to remember, oh, let's find her name then. We could see all the information that's entered here for that employee, for her name does. All the miscellaneous pays, the regular pay that pulled in, all of his taxes, all of the pay account information is listed here as well. Um, then at the bottom of the report, we scroll down here. There we go. Whoops.
we have our um, our totals, our gross, our net, the amount charged for the uh, you know, the payroll items, the direct deposit total, the total number of physical checks that are being created, the total dollar amount for the physical checks, how many employees were being paid, how many positions are being paid, uh, the payroll items, the total number, total dollar amount for the annuities, how many female employees, how many certified employees are being paid. We have your pay type totals listed here. We have all of your payroll item totals list the employee total, the board total, as well as how many employees are being paid from each. Um, hold on. We should see, let me see. Not seeing, where is it? My future. You should see it like your regular and your future totals. I'm not seeing it. Hold on here. Let's go back to the top. Oh, right here. Jeez. Right for my eyes. That was at the beginning. So we got your future total here, your total current gross, and then your total gross all the way around. So we've got this would be like your initial initialization like how much was processed when you initialize without anything in future. But as I said, if the district wants to, they can just add the future and initialize the payroll. It will list the initial gross with the future and then it gives them a total of, of, the, of the total pay. So um, it also gives you all the different pay groups and the number of employees that are being, or number of positions, I should say, not employees positions that are being paid from each pay group. Also gives you a breakdown of your regular pay, the accrued payments, and your miscellaneous totals as well. So your pay report still gives you a lot of information, just like it did in Classic, plus some. It gives you a little bit more. Um, if there were any errors processed when you initialize, it would be on this error report. And a lot of times if there are errors, they may be, uh, talk about the accrued wages, which is not a huge problem. Those are normally just warnings to just tell you, yeah, like here, yeah, accrued pay amount is greater than the remaining total of accrued. Those normally are not errors that you need to really be concerned about. It's just they were probably being paid out of accrued wages on this payroll. And it's uh, showing that the that amount is greater than the remaining accrued is sitting out there. But again, nothing to really be concerned about. Um, the severity, when you have uh, something that says error, in redesign, the, the word error is considered a fatal. So in that case, something that is listed as an error or a fatal needs to be corrected before you can continue on with the pay. It will not let you go on unless it's corrected. Um, yeah, another report that gets created is called the pay item detail report. Go ahead and pull that up. And again, the district has the capability of going in and naming a report under the report title. They have the capability of sorting, you know, by employee name or the number. And if they want to begin each payroll item on a new page, they could click the box to do so. If they only wanted to look to uh, report or look at a report with only certain payroll items, they could choose those particular payroll items by double clicking or clicking on it and then clicking that right arrow to move them over to the selected area. I'm just going to go ahead and move them back. If I don't put anything in the selected area, it will give me all of the payroll items, which is probably what they're going to want. So I'm going to go ahead and just click on the generate report option. And then this gives me a listing of everything that is being pulled or being paid 
or withheld from the employees for this payroll. So it gives me all the information and like, here's your 001, it gives you a total. And since I checked that box, it's going to a new page. So the 002 then is listed on the next page. And the same thing gives you totals um, for the employee share, the applicable gross and the gross wages. Same thing for your state, your cities, et cetera. So everything is listed on this report. And then at the bottom of the report, it'll give you the number of payroll items, the total employee share, uh, the, the total um, employer share, total applicable gross to gross wages. It also gives you your SERS pickup and SCRS pickup total as well, as well as if you were in bands in the, over the summer months, it would give you a uh, total there as well on this report. That's very similar to classic. Um, let's go back here. We have a budget distribution report. And again, I could give us a, a name because of the payroll I'm processing it for. We could say it's the 315-21 budget distribution report. Uh, hold on here, I wanna go ahead and click on generate report. This report is very similar. If you're again familiar with classic, it's very similar to the bud debt report. This is the report when it's actually finalized, when you're when you posted it. This report is actually the one that the treasurer will sign. It gives you all of the account information, the gross expended from each account. Gives you a fund uh, total at the bottom, like how much was spent from each fund. And that gives you a grand total and the total of all the funds at the bottom. So the district can use that to balance, make sure that it's matching, the total of all funds is matching their pay report totals. Then we have the pay account distribution report. The pay account distribution report is very similar to the Bud Disson Classic the budget distribution report. We're gonna go ahead and again, I wanna name this 31521 payroll. And they can generate that report. And what a lot of districts do is they basically create like a folder for each payroll that they're processing. And then they put those, they can put those reports right in that folder. That way they've got them. But again, like I said, all of these reports should process and go out to the final archive when you've actually done the posting. So, but it's just like a safe a safeguard. They actually have the reports in a folder and they, they also should be uh, copied out to the final archive. Excuse me. All right, so here's uh, what the uh, pay account distribution report, detail report looks like. It has the employee information, dollar amount that was expended, which account it was expended from, gives you all the budget subtotals. And then at the very bottom, uh, there's a summary which shows you all the fund totals and then the total for all the funds. So again, that dollar amount should be matching what is on your pay report as far as the, uh, the payroll goes, as far as the payroll amount. So again, these are all the reports after you initialize the payroll. So you've initialized the payroll, you're going in and, and verifying and viewing all of these reports. We also have out under reports, and we do have a JIRA issue out there to add this to the payroll process itself. It's kind of a hassle, but you have to go to reports. And we have what is called a pay amount summary report, which is like a per pay report in classic. 
or I'm sorry, to pay some important class in. Gee, I'm telling you the wrong thing. Pay some report. So we're going to go ahead and click on that pay amount summary report. And again, I can give that report a different title like NCA. It's a 315.21 pay amount summary report. And then I have to define which payroll this report is for. So obviously, I have one payroll being processed, so it's going to be this 315 payroll. Do I want to display subtotals on this report? I, if I don't, I could uncheck it. If I do, I could check it. Do I want a page break on employees? If I wanted to, I could check that. If not, leave it unchecked. How do I want to sort this report? Again, you can see we have the option to sort by pay group, name, oops, oops, building department or by employee number. I'm going to go ahead and sort by pay group this time. And then if we wanted to select specific pay groups to exclude, and this is another thing that we want to change. Kind of silly. Why not just be able to say, I only want to include pay group 34. But this is, you're selecting the pay groups to exclude, which makes no sense. We want to be able to just include, you know, select the ones we want to include on the report. So we are going to change that. But if they only wanted to process this for a particular pay group, they would put all of the pay groups they don't want over in selected. And then we'll give them the one that they do on. So again, it's kind of a little backwards, I think, but we're going to change that eventually. So I'm going to go ahead now and click the generate report option. And when I do that, this should give me a pay summary of the entire payroll. So again, it gives me like the employee information, their number, their name, the building, the position number, the pay group. And like I said, I sorted it by pay group. So it basically lists starting with pay group 10, then 11, 12, et cetera. The uh, regular units, regular pay, accrued pay, miscellaneous units, the overtime, if any, the docs, the retro, the regular pay type, other pay type, and then the actual pay total. And then at the bottom, it will give you grand totals of your regular pay, your accrued wages, miscellaneous, et cetera. And then your contract totals are listed. <clears throat> All right. So now I need to go back to my payroll. And it's in progress. So it, that will still be showing as that payroll that, I want, that I'm processing. So all I need to do is go in and click the detail button. And when I do that, it's going to bring me back to all where all those reports were at. So at this point, if everything looked good, like on my pay report, everything looked good on my payroll item details, I could go in and, and complete the pay. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if a district needs to make a change, maybe they forgot to increase someone a, a payroll item or a rate for a payroll item. Um, what happens is anything that gets modified other than the compensation. So keep in mind, if you make a, a, a change to a compensation, that will not be updated on the fly you'll have to go back in and make a modification to the payroll for that particular pay group, modify that pay group so that the change that you made in compensation takes effect. But anything else that you make changes to, like on the employee record, the payroll item record, those get updated on the fly. So those will automatically be updated. So I'll give you an example. Let's go in to payroll items for our friend Hernandez, who we pick on the most here. Actually, what I should do, let's go to the pay report and see what payroll items he has being paid. Um, let's see, I probably could just pull up. Um, a 
I'll hold it. I know I saved it. Let me just pull it up. I can. Um, he will report. Here it is. All right. So we're going to pull this up and find her name better. All right, so he has an annuity, 2084. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of pick on that one. All right, let's get out of here. And then we'll find him. Uh, let's see, it's probably... It's probably this one. We're gonna go in and make a modification here. We're gonna change this to $50. I'm gonna change that. All right, now if I go back into the payroll, if I look at the pay report, Reprocess it. Takes a couple seconds. Like I said, I think it's my internet connection. It's very acting up here. Um, yeah, we'll see now that I changed that to $50 and it changed it on the payroll on the fly. When I just went back in and reran the pay report, it just changed it automatically. Now, like I said, if he, I was making a change, to the compensation, what I would have to do is if I made the change to the compensation record, I'd have to go in after I made the change and do a modify. So I click on the modify payroll button and then whatever pay group he is in, he was in pay group 11, whatever, I would click the, the checkbox next to it, then I would just click the update payroll button. When I do that, then it should update the change that I made in the compensation record for him. But I mean, that's the only time you have to do that. If anything else has changed, that it should update on the fly when you rerun the pay report. But with any change to the compensation will not. So just keep that in mind. All right, we'll just do this. I, that was just kind of a little, a little note, so you know that. All right. Okay, as soon as that finishes, initializing, okay, we're good. So at this point, I was able to go in, I made my modification to her name this for that payroll item. That's done, I saw it on my re pay report, that is good. Now, since I made that change, I may want to go back in and run the payroll item detail report as well, because obviously I changed it from 47, 56, whatever it was to $50. Well, now that's going to affect that payroll item detail report as well. So I would probably, if it was me, if I made a change to anything like the payroll item, et cetera, I would rerun the reports, reprocess them to make sure that I have the most accurate data on a report. So once we've gone through and we've verified everything is accurate, what we can do is we can post the payroll. But before I talk about posting payroll, you'll see we have these two options, this delete payroll option and delete payroll and exceptions option. What those mean are if I went in and clicked the delete payroll option right now, what it would do is Anything that I had added in future will actually go back out to future. 
Now, the way it's supposed to work, if you if the district went in and added uh, things in current, it should also move that back to future as well. Now, we had a report that um, wasn't working right for, I think it was a miscellaneous for a substitute. We have a, a, an issue out there to fix it, but it should be doing that. If it doesn't, um, we do have an issue to correct it. But the intention is, if you have, have data that you added to future, or if you added data to current, you manually added data to current, anything that was added, like exceptions, if you delete the payroll, it would move back to future regardless, where that's a little different than classic because if you manually added something in current and you had to delete the payroll for any reason, what you manually added in current was gone. You had to re-add it. So this is a nice feature. It should just move it to future if you manually added it in current. That way you could re, you know, initialize the payroll again. All that data would pull back in. You wouldn't have to worry about, you know, re-adding all that data in the current. Now, this delete payroll and exceptions option, if you chose that, it's basically going to delete everything, all the exception data that you entered in. It'll delete everything out. You just have to remember that. If you're ever deleting the payroll, you probably just want to just delete payroll so you can start over. You don't want to delete your exceptions that you entered. You just want to delete the payroll. So those are two things to keep in mind when you're processing payroll. But once we've gone through it, we've verified that everything is accurate in our payroll, we could actually post payroll. Now, when I'm saying post payroll, I'm not talking about posting it to USAS yet. We're not doing that. All we're doing is we're basically like classic, we're running check updates. We're pretty much basically saying, hey, the payroll is good. Let's get the history updated. That's what this post payroll option is doing. So I'm going to go ahead and click the post payroll option. And once I've done that, you're going to see all those same reports that we looked at before are going to be out there, like your pay report, the pay uh, pay item detail report, uh, the pay distribution, the pay account distribution. All those are going to be out there. Now, there really shouldn't be any difference. There shouldn't be any changes to them that we know of, right? Because we didn't do any change and make any more changes. But the only thing that's going to be different now, for my sake, I would go in and just verify, like on the pay report, the totals still match. They're, they're still accurate. The pay item detail report, same thing. And that just takes two seconds just to open the report and verify your totals. But the only report that's going to look a little different is this budget distribution detail report. Because at that point, when you process this report, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna call this one the final budget distribution report. And they this or can do that. Like if they wanted to go in when they initialize and they they could they rename, they name those reports, like they could do. 31521 initial report, 31521 payroll item uh, detail report. They could call them all initial. Then when they're running it again, they could call it a final report, which is the very final one that they're actually processing. Okay, so on this report, like I said, the only difference from the initial report that we ran to this one is, now we have the treasurer certificate information where they have to sign for the payroll listed on this report. That's the only difference between the initial report and this report. Um, if we needed to, if we have not paid payables yet, basically meaning we haven't paid any of the payroll items or we haven't processed the HSA uh, tape file, if your district processes a, a tape file, Raise your say. If you haven't done one of those, either of those things, you could actually go in and unpost the payroll and make a change if you needed to. You could do that, and then you again after you unpost the payroll, it's it's strongly suggested that you you know you reprocess the reports. And if you had processed payments and email notifications, 
I would probably go in and, and reprocess everything to make sure that you have the correct data on those newest reports and the newest uh, you know, files that need to be out there if you needed to unpose. So keep in mind, if you need to unpose, um, you, you could not have ran uh, the outstanding payables, which is paying your deductions, or you couldn't have created the HSA uh, tape file, ACH tape file yet. Those are the two keys in unposting. You cannot do those, cannot have those two done. Okay, now if I want to go ahead and process payments, what that basically means is do I want to print checks or direct deposits? So I'm going to go in and click on the process payments option. And when I do that, remember we did have a check for $100. I remember seeing that on the pay report. So we have one employee who is getting a check. So I'm going to go ahead first and do the checks option. And then it asked me the output format. So if district uses um, Edge for their printing software, they're probably going to be using the XML export option. And then the, the bank account, as we talked about yesterday, remember how we talked about the bank account information? Remember how I added bank one or, or we had default and then we added the bank two? If for some reason we were using bank two, we would define that bank two on this um, setup screen. I'm just going to leave it as a default bank. The sort by, again, you can choose out of, of several different sorting options. So that's just one person, not a big deal. The starting check number can be left blank because it should default to the next available check for that bank account that's out there. And then the file name is called check.xml. So if I want to create the XML file, I just go ahead and click the process payments option. And when I do that, my XML file gets created. At that point, I can take that file, transfer it over to Edge, and print out my check. Or if I wanted to use, if, they, if the district uses, I think it's ABS, they might use a PDF file. We could do the same thing. We could use a PDF option for the checks and do it that way. Now, we also have the capability of doing the direct deposit option. So, Direct deposits, if they print direct deposits out, you still may be using the XML format to send it over to Edge to print. If not, say that they don't print any direct deposits out, but you want a copy of what the direct deposits are going to look like, you could choose the PDF option. And then again, the bank account information, it needs to be populated. It defaults to the default bank account how we want to sort, and then we want to select the print all checks option because um, if, if we, okay, say that you have employees that do get direct deposit notices, but some that don't get, or not yet, yeah, some that don't get notices, if we choose this print all direct deposits box, it's going to include notices for email direct deposit employees. We would, we would go ahead and click on that box to include it for those particular employees. You want to include it for everybody, including those in direct deposit notice employees. So you can see the file name defaults to direct deposit PDF. And then you have the capability or districts to of actually creating a customized form file if they wanted to, to use. Um, I'll show you how to do that. I think actually we may show that in our advanced training, but um, that if, if they use the customized form file, they could actually pull that and use that here if they wanted to. Here, we're just using the default. So I'm going to go ahead and just click the process payments option. And again, I just use the PDF version. And this all hinges on what they use as far as printing out direct deposit paper notices or not printing them out. Maybe you just want to copy for yourself, you can do that by just printing that PDF version. So here is basically all of the direct deposit notices for every employee in the PDF version format. 
So those are how you're going to print those out, either the XML file or the PDF version, one way or the other. You're going to get files. You probably need to transfer over to your printing software so you can print those out. Our last option here is your email notices. So if you have email direct deposits that need to be sent out, you just click on this email notices button. And you'll notice here that we have a date and time to send the email notices. So in classic, we have the eager depth where you could set like a date for future for the email notices to get sent out. You can do the same thing here. So maybe I, I don't want to send these notices out today. I want to send them out on the 15th at two o'clock in the morning. Okay, so I set my date at 3.15, my time is two o'clock a.m. Now, I want all my employees are selected. So everybody here is email, set up as email direct deposit. So they're all going to get notices when this triggers, when it sends them out. So basically all I need to do is I need to make sure my bank account is set up correctly. And then again, if I have a, had a custom form file that I use for the direct deposit, I could choose that from the drop down. I'm gonna just choose it, the default. And then I'm gonna click the schedule sending of selected email notices. And then when I do that, it should tell me like how many notices, which it does, tell the 26 email direct deposit notices were scheduled. So obviously we must have some that are not email direct deposit notices that get paper because we have like what, 50 some employees. So that leads me to believe that we have like, you know, maybe, 20 some employees that get a paper notice. So now if I want to, I can go out and verify that that job is sitting out there waiting to be sent. And how I can do that is if I go to utilities, we have what's called a job scheduler. And again, if it all depends on what roles people have assigned, if they can actually see the job scheduler or not, but I can see my job sitting out there ready, being, you know, ready, being ready to be processed on 315 at 2 o'clock a.m. And you can see that it says the status is pending. So obviously it hasn't been processed yet. Well, when it processes on 315 at 2 a.m., it's going to show that that process has been completed. It finished the process. Now, if for some reason, say that, okay, here's an example. Maybe we ran all the way through everything and then we needed to unpost the payroll, okay? Like I said before, if we unposted it, we made changes, I would go back and rerun the reports, rerun the, the, pro, the payment processing, as well as your email uh, direct deposit notices. I would rerun that. So if that's the case, I don't want this job sitting out there because I'm going to rerun, I'm going to make an, a new run. I could go in and just delete that by clicking the X button and that, that job would be deleted then. And then I could put my new job out there by going back into the email notices and reprocessing that. All right, let's see, I gotta kind of roll through here. All right, so after we've finished that portion of the payroll, we've got the payroll process. If I go back to payroll processing, since I posted the payroll, it's not going to show as an in-progress payroll anymore. We've already posted it. So I could go to the posted option. And at this point, I still have not created my HSA tape file if I have to, if I have one. And I have not posted outstanding payables. I haven't paid any of them yet. So if I wanted to at this point, I could go into the detail I still have the capability of unposting this payroll and making a change at that, what, at that point. So I'm gonna go ahead and unpost. And it asked me, am, am I sure I wanna do that? Yeah, I do, I wanna do that. So right now it's unposting and it shows you the status of the unpost. 
So at this point, I could go in if I need to make a change to a payroll item or maybe someone's pay or, or maybe I need to add a pay uh, for someone. I could do all that if I wanted to. But like I say, I would rerun the reports and then post the payroll again and then reprocess the uh, payments as well as the email notices. I would reprocess all of that just to verify you have good data on your reports that, that get copied out to the file archive. <clears throat> All right, now the next thing that we have to do, obviously, is we have to get our direct deposit tape file to the bank. You gotta do that. So in order to do that, uh, we have to go out to the reports option. We have this ACH submission option. If we click on that, this is going to give us the, the, the choice of ACH submission or HSA submission. We're going to go ahead and choose the AC ACH submission. And you'll notice that it already defaults to the pay date. It, all, it defaults to the pay ACH transfer option. And we don't have any other options out there. We don't, so that it's choosing the correct one from the ACH source field. Um, include the SSN. Um, the SSN will not be included. We defaulted to that. If for some reason you, they want the SSN on there, they can go in and make that change by using the drop down. How do they want to sort it? They have the capability of sorting the, the report by name or by uh, employee identification number. What kind of uh, format do they want? You'll notice it's already in PDF, which more than likely when you're running a report, you want for this, you're probably gonna want it PDF format. But you have to go in here and you select the payroll that you're wanting to generate the report for. So I selected that payroll. Now I'm gonna click that generate report tab When I do that, I should get a report showing me all of my direct deposit payment information. And as well, it should give me a total, the total at the bottom. Well, that total should match my pay report total for direct deposits. It's a little slow. All right. There we go. All right, so here's what our report looks like. Gives us all the information for the, all the employees. Like I said, it gives us totals at the bottom. And you'll actually compare your total to your pay report total, make sure everything matches for that direct deposit. And if everything matches, then they can go in. And if, they, if the district uses pre-notes, um, they would want to go in and check this convert pre notes on the ACH submission file generation and then click the generate submission file option. And you'll see the ACH, it said I need pre notes for converted over. And then we get a, a tape file that the district can then upload to their bank for their direct deposit. All right, now I don't have anything set up for the HSA on the ACH source, but if we had an ACH source and we actually had um, uh, HSAs, we would actually be able to create a report using the HSA submission tab, we could create, oh, maybe we do. Oh, maybe I do, hold on here. We'll try it. I didn't think I did, but maybe I did set one up. But you can see it's very similar, except it's just asking you for the HSA ACH source. You just have to make sure you choose the right one. And the include employee SOCH and the sort by options are the same. So if I go ahead and click the generate HSA report, 
we'll see if I get a report. Like I said, I'm not really sure. Hey, I did. I do have an employee that has an HSA. So it gives me a report with the HSA information as well as the total for the HSA. And if I go back in, since that, that pay is already checked, it's marked. I'm going to click the generate HSA submission file. It should create a submission file that the bank can upload to the bank, just like they do their uh, direct deposit tape file. Yeah, the, something came up here. It's a little of an error. It could have to do with the uh, the routing number because we had issues. Our anonymizer doesn't add like eight characters for the routing number. So we have to go in and we have to add it. And my guess is I probably forgot to do that. But that would be how you can actually create your HSA submission file and a report for that submission file as well. <clears throat> right, um, at this point, we can actually go into the use as integration option. Now, um, one thing to keep in mind, this use as integration tab will not be viewable unless it's actually turned on. This use as integration tab can be turned on under the system configuration option, I believe, all oh, modules, let me check. Gotta go back in here real quick. Yeah, it's right here. Oh no, it's not, it's a module, my bad. It is a module, so we have to go in under system modules. And right now the use as integration module is turned on. You can see that, it's here. But if I went into the modules, Right here is the use as integration module. If I went in and turned it off, that use as integration option, if I refresh, is going to be gone. Yeah, and you can see that it's gone. Now I want to turn it back on because we're going to actually be using it. And normally, anybody that has your uh, group manager payroll access should be able to see the uh, use as integration module. All right, before we go back to the use as integration module, I do want to show you a couple other things under reports that we have available. Um, go into this. We have an employer distribution report that can be processed. So basically, that's like board disk. It's a report like board disk that can be used to uh, verify totals for your board distributions. And they can uh, run it pretty much just like they do in classic. Uh, they could go in, put in the uh, payroll beginning date or the payroll date that they want to process for the start date, the end date. So maybe they had payrolls on 315 and 330. They would put 315 to 330 if they do it at the end of the month. If they do it every pay, they would put like 315 through 315. I'll go ahead and do 315. And then I don't need to choose a payment cycle if I don't want to, but I can. I'm just going to leave it blank. And I'm also going to leave the, uh, the payroll item code blank. If I wanted to run it for just a specific payroll item code, or maybe I wanted just to run it for the, uh, the board chair of the retirement, I could do that. We also have the use only employer distribution accounts option so they could check or uncheck it. For retirement, they probably would want it checked. And then we have a summarized individual amount detail. I'll just leave that checked because that is defaulted. But if I go in here now and click the generate report, I should get a report for the employer distribution only for the 400s and the 450s. 
because I chose those. If I didn't choose those, it's going to give me everything that basically was uh, paid for employer distributions. But a lot of times, I know districts like to have them separated, or maybe if they want to, they could just include everything all on one report. It's up to the district how they process. But we have like all the 400 information, all the 450 information on the report. Another uh, option that we have is the employer retirement share. So if your district does not use a uh, board desk for um, processing maybe the retirement, maybe you're, they use uh, the uh, bud, uh, oh gosh, what is it? My mind just drew a total blank. Not but that. Hold on. Well, I'll figure it out. It'll come to me. But um, it's to say it's basically the same as classic as far as processing the employer retirement share distribution, but they're not using the, the board this option. They could go in and put in their beginning date and their ending date. Now, this report does allow the capability of running. STRS separately and then STRS separately if they want to, or they can process everything all at one time. I'll just go ahead and throw in a, a number amount to distribute. I'm going to generate the report. Lori? Yes. Yes. Does that look to the fund accounting for the amounts? I mean, you put in the amounts, but does it look to the fund accounting for it the does. requirement? Yeah, I just threw in some amounts. Still yeah. like it does in classic? Yes, yes. I can't think of the name of the report because it's a use as pro uh, program now in classic. It's a board rep. Board rut, thank you. I'm just my mind just totally went blank. Board rut. That this this is similar to board rut. So if they're using board rut, they're actually going in and entering, plugging in the uh, the amounts into the report, and then they're going to be doing the same thing when they go into the use as integration. Thank you, Brenda, for telling me. I could not get the name. It just it totally escaped me. <laughs> board rut. <laughs> Okay, so again, you can actually process reports before you actually run the employer distribution report and the employer retirement share if they you know, use both. So now if I go to the USAS integration, you will see here we have the employer distribution submission, which basically will allow them to process like board, like board distant and classic, it will allow them to process a file that can actually be posted to use as that they can actually then use. They will actually load that. So I'll just go in and do my 315. Again, I'm not choosing my pay cycle. I'm just going to choose, you know what, let me do, not do the retirement. I'm going to do the Medicare down here and do Medicare for now. And I'll just click, we have the show submission preview. So it actually will list, it'll tell you, oops, yeah, this account, I'm sorry, I forgot this, this uh, instance has weird accounts listed, expenditure accounts, and it doesn't work well. But what will happen is when you click the show submission preview, it actually gives you this right here, this dollar amount information. And a lot of times the district will take that and they will compare that to the reports from the payroll and verify that that board amount is truly the correct amount. Once they've done that, they can actually cl click on this submit to use as option. And this also has an account and the amount information as well on the report. If those accounts, which are not good, would show they would be here as well. 
you could then click that submit to use as option and that the the file that you submitted to use as would be sitting out here ready to be posted or it would be posted to use as and then they will just pull that in and do their processing we also have the employer retirement share which is your board rent you can do the same thing here very similar they're going to go and put the beginning and ending dates then the the SCRS amount to contribute or to distribute, sorry. And the same thing for the SCRS amount to distribute. And then they have the capability of doing the show submission preview. And then we'll actually list all the information. Let me, let me try it, let me see. I don't know if it will do it just because of those weird accounts that are out here. Yeah, it gives them the same thing. I figured it would. But it should show you all the information as far as like the pay name, which would be like SERS or SCRS, the account information and the amounts for both. And then again, if these are accurate compared to the reports that you have processed, you could actually click the submit employer share of retirement to use as. And then once you've done that, this will actually it'll show that though that has been submitted to use as and then on the use as side they will see that and then use that for their processing we also have under the use as integration tab the payroll submission option this is just like uh, the posting of the batch file when you're posting the batch file in classic you're actually going to be posting that file to use as so in order to do that, you use that uh, use as payroll submission option. You would go in and you find the payroll that you want to post. And you click that post to use as button. And then you go in here. This gives you all of the, the account information, the amount information from the payroll that you just processed. Over here on the left, it gives you the information from the payroll gives you the total dollar of the payroll. You'll want to verify and make sure that that is accurate in comparison to your pay report totals. And if it is, then all they need to do is click the submit to use as option. When they click that option, it will say that the post was the file was sent and it'll give you the time and the day that it was sent to use as. So you know that the file has been sent. Okay, um, let's see here. Let's see, yeah, that was pretty good. I don't wanna go through. Now we're gonna go ahead and take about a five minute break and we'll meet back here at about 10, let's see, 10.30. We'll meet back at 10.30 and we'll go from there. Okay, welcome back and we'll go ahead and continue on here for day two. Um, we were talking about the use as integration screen as far as employer distributions, employer retirement share, and payroll submission. Uh, we're going to go ahead now and we're going to go into, we're going to actually process the uh, checks or direct or electronic payments or the uh, deductions or the payroll items. So in order, order to do that, we need to go to the processing tab. We go to that pro to the processing outstanding payables option. <clears throat> and the first thing that we do normally is because we normally want a report listing all of the payable items that were paid that are being paid, we're gonna have to create reports for that for that that fact. Um, one thing to keep in mind, when we ran the payroll itself, we had the payroll item detail reports. Those were the payroll items that were being paid or withheld during that payroll. The payables, outstanding payables, may have possibly adjustments sitting out there from a prior pay 
or a refund or something like that. Those are sitting out here. So the, the totals on this report could be different than the payables item detail report that you looked at initially. So just keep that in mind because this is actually what you're actually going to be paying to the vendor. So if I wanted to create some reports just so I have these reports, so it shows me, you know, the dollar amounts for each uh, individual item and each individual employee, I could go to this payable reports tab. Now, from there, I can go ahead and if I wanted to do a page break on the payroll item codes, I could just check that box. That way they would be separated on each, you know, separate page for each payroll item. Um, if I don't choose the pay cycle, it's going to give me everything that was processed, but everything that's sitting out there and not seeing payables. If I only wanted payroll items that are to be paid every payroll, I would just double click on every payroll and move it over to the selected box. If I only wanted sp certain payroll items, I could choose those payroll items. Or if I want all of them, I could just leave the selected blank and they should give me all the payroll items. So you can see here we have a full report option and a summary report option. I'll go ahead and click the full report option first. and save it. And when I do, I'll pull it up. You can see I've got my federal and there's my totals. I state all my totals. So it gives me all the information, my retirement, my 594.50, 591.00, I'm in six, your HSA. But you'll notice all of these items are only the items that get paid every payroll because I chose that option. If I wanted everything that's sitting out there, I could have processed, just left everything blank as far as the selections here, left them all blank and it would give me everything. But it's really nice because I could go in Okay, I could run a report for everything. Then I could run a report, maybe I only want the city item. So I could go in and just select from the beginning city item to the last city item, move them over. Then I could create a full report for just those. I could do a full report for my school district items. You know, it's really nice you could create reports for all separate items or However, how are the districts wanting to do it? I mean, the, it's up to them how they want to process them. So now after I've done this, I want to go in and create a summary report. Again, I could choose every payroll. I just don't want to choose a summary report for every, everything that's paid every payroll. So this just gives me a summary of all the items that are going to be paid every that are paid every payroll. Basically, what I will be paying is me a listing of all those. All right. Once I've gotten all my reports created, how I want them, I could go in then to the outstanding payables. Come on. Stuck. There we go. You can see we have a few different options out here as far as like what we would see on this grid. We have payables by payee. So you can see what items are included on here. We have just the payee name, number, employee amount, employer amount, the count, and the, if it's an electronic payment or not. We have the payables by pay item configuration. So actually, the, the more the higher up you go, the more detail there is under each um, item.
So you can see here we added like the configuration code. And then if we go to the payables by payroll item, now we have the employee information as well as the configuration code and all the other data that was included. And then the payables detail has a lot of information. Now, the really nice thing with these, you can filter on these grids, anything that has the white, you can filter on it. The pay date is a problem right now. We do, again, we have a ticket out there to fix that. There were issues with it, that's why we turned it off. But uh, eventually, hopefully we can get that restored. But I could filter if I wanted to, maybe by the payroll description. You can see here, we have like a bunch of different ones. Maybe I just want to filter, I don't want to see anything. It was from test. I could filter and it only give me everything that was on test. Or if I want the 315, 21 payroll, I could type that in. It will give me all my payroll information for this pay. So what I'm going to do, I want to go ahead and I want to pay everything that needs to be paid on every payroll because it's the first pay of the month. So you can see when I chose that, it has certain payroll items selected. Since I'm still in the payables detail, it's given me everything. If I went back to the payables by payee, it's gonna narrow it down considerably. Be a lot, a lot less. All right, so then I can select which payables I wanna pay by either manually going in one by one and selecting them, or I could click this box here to select them all. And you'll notice when I click that, everything moved over to the selected payable summary area because I'm getting ready to make the payment for all of these payables. So when I've done that, I could actually go in and I can go ahead and post this because I've got them pulled over. Whoops, hold on here. Oh, I must have a negative amount. Let me do this. I, I saw some negatives out there. Let me just do this. Yeah. All right. There's no negatives. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on the post. And you'll see that it defaults to today's date. And it, it asks for a bank account, but again, you can choose which bank account right. it needs to be, be, be coming or being charged out of. Whether you want an output format of XML, you know, if you have, if your district uses the edge to print out checks, you're gonna probably be using the XML option or the PDF option. They're gonna be printing out uh, checks if they have a software printing software that uses the PDF option. You can see that the starting check number is already defined. That is changeable if they need to change it for some reason. But then all I need to do is click on the post button. When I click on the post button, what's gonna happen is it should give me the XML file for printing. It, also, it will also give me a report, a payables payment report. So here's the report, and here is the XML file. So it gave me two different things. It gave me the XML file that I can take and upload to my printing software and print out. It also gave me this payables report, which looks very similar to that uh, summary report that I, I created. But obviously I only pulled in certain payees. So it doesn't match that report, but it, it should in general when you pull in, you know, all of the, the proper payees that you want to pay. Um, another feature on this, uh, the uh, outstanding payable screen is this payables adjustment. What that can be used for is maybe you had an employee who um, you had withheld let's say health insurance for, for and it shouldn't have been withheld. Okay, the company, the vendor, they sent the money back to you already. They already gave you that money back, okay? So you went in 
and you did a refund for that employee, you gave me money back. Well, that negative would be uh, sitting out here affecting that particular uh, vendor. So you have the capability of going in and making an offsetting record. So let's just say, I think we had a negative. Yeah, let me, let me fix this one. All the signs. Let me figure out who the employee is. Hopefully, I can find it. Uh, I didn't get the. Uh, signs. Helmet signs. Five forty one. Okay. So let me go to the detail and pull up with a 541. See if hopefully there's just one particular employee. Maybe whoops, I'm getting rid of this. Maybe. Come on. Well, is that working? Okay. Hold on, let me, let me just find somebody here. Let's just do him. We're gonna go in. So right now we'll look at the, the 590. Whoops, I pull up the page item configuration. I'm trying to give you a good example here. Um, all right, so we've got uh, the 591 sitting out there for an employee amount of 2265.92. All right, now I'm going to go in and let's find, I have to find an employee. I'm just to randomly run in and find an employee that has a 591. Maybe. Oh, sorry, it's so slow. Okay. Okay. So I will go back to processing. And if I go in, what, what I'm just going to show you is the initial, the 591 showed 2265.92 as a dollar amount. But if I go into the, the payables adjustment, and I created an adjustment, and the 591. Yeah. And let's just say I'm going to put in a negative. I'll do uh, 500. And I could put a description in if I want. And you could also do an employer amount as well. I'm going to go ahead and save that. When I do that, if I go back out and look at the 591, it should be shorted by the $500. So it'd be like 1765 now. It basically made the adjustment before I create the check of what it amounts to. Yeah, right here, 1765.92. So it made an adjustment to the, the dollar amount of my check before I actually create it. That's what you can use that payable adjustments for if you're needing to make an adjustment to the dollar amount on that check. All right, are there any questions on the uh, saving payables processing? Hey, Lori, it's Brian. Yeah. Hey, I do have a quick question. Sure. Is there a payables report, like when you pull, say, a city tax monthly, 
that shows you the applicable gross and the total gross on the same report? No, and I know, Brian, I'm pretty sure we have a deer issue out there because we've had requests for that. And yeah, that would be really beneficial. <laughs> it yeah. would be really helpful because it, you need both. Yeah, some of the city taxes out for it, so. Yeah, yeah, that, right. I know we do have a deer issue because I remember seeing that. So we do have a deer issue out there, but right now it does not do that, but hopefully yeah. we will have that. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, we're gonna go back to use as integration a little bit and talk about that just briefly. We already went over some of the objects that are already available in there, but we have one uh, called account, account synchronization. And what that is used for is it's used to um, synchronize payroll with USAS as far as the expenditure accounts. Now, there's a program that processes nightly to synchronize, but let's just say that USAS created a new pay account or pay, create a new account today, and the district is running payroll today, and they're, they're wanting to use that account. Before they can actually use that account, they have to synchronize the accounts together in order for that account to pull over and be an, avail an available expenditure account that's um, available to use. So you have to, they have to make sure that they would run that that day. They'd have to go in and run the account synchronization program that day. And when they do that, what happens is they just go in to the account synchronization and then they just click on the synchronize accounts with the USAS option. And once they do that, it will start, it will start processing. And the, They've made this a lot quicker. It used to have a, it used to be quite slow, but what it's doing is taking, it puts multiple files into, uh, multiple records into files. So it might say file one, you know, of six completed. So it's basically doing that. And then it will tell you when it's done. It'll tell you the uh, synchronization was completed. So that's a nice thing, but you have to remember if the account was added on the day that you're trying to use the account, you have to synchronize the accounts before you can actually use it. We talked about employer distribution. We talked about employer retirement. We do have expenditure accounts of object out there now. And all this is, it's more or less just for uh, viewing to basically see what expenditure accounts are actually pulled in or synced from USAS. So maybe you want to go in and see if uh, there's an account out there. You could actually go in and start filtering uh, the fund, the function, and this is, should start narrowing it down like these object, you know, the uh, benefit accounts, pulls those in. Let's just see what else. Um, what do four? Like I said, the more you put in as far as the dimensions, the more it starts narrowing it down. So basically, I only I have three accounts out here that that uh, meet that criteria of the 01 of the 147. So this is nice. You can get you can actually go in and see these uh, accounts that are pulling in. And someone had asked yesterday about the XREF codes from uh, USAS and uh, if they have XREF code, X rough codes, I can't say that, in USAS, um, when you're pulling the expenditure accounts, like on the pay account screen, you should be able to see the XREF code. It would actually pull the XREF code up. But we're not actually using them in pay accounts, but it will actually display on there. It should show on there, on the pay account. I asked one of the developers about that this morning just to verify. Um, another option we have is the lead projection submission. Now we do have, before you would run the, the lead projection submission, if your district does do lead projection, out in the reports, we do have lead projection reports that can be ran before they actually run the process and use this integration. Uh, there's 
basically an error report, an employee detail, an account detail, and then an account summary report that can be processed before they actually truly go in and process the leave projection for USAS. So those are already out there and they are available to use. But the leave projection, again, they would put in their beginning dates and ending dates. Um, if they want to include absences already posted in USAS. And then the selected leave types are already defaulted to personal sick and vacation. And then they would just do a show submission. It'll show all the accounts information and all the dollar amounts for each account that's being um, accounted for. And then when they're ready, if everything looks accurate, they can click that submit to USAS button. And again, just like your employer distribution and employer retirement, the line entry will be sitting out here showing that it was actually submitted to USAS. Payment unvoid, void and unvoid submission. That is new. I'm not even sure if we actually have that out there yet to use. Not, I don't think we do. So I'm not going to talk too much about that because that we're using this, this test instance, so it may have this out there available, but it's not, I don't think we have it out there yet that I know of. So I'm not gonna show that to you yet. Um, the payroll submission we talked about, there's a security configuration. And this basically is when you're initially setting up the district, you have to go in and you have to match the, uh, integration security configuration, the key, the API keys. So like what I would be doing here is I have to go in and make sure my API key from USAS is in here and then one from payroll is in USAS so the two systems work together correctly. And then there's a test connection option. Once you've gone in and you've, you've uh, basically set up those API keys and you've got the security configuration set up, you can actually test it and verify and make sure that it's working correctly with USAS. <coughs> now the next uh, tab that we're going to talk about is the payments tab. And you'll notice there's several different options under the payments tab. Payments basically can be used for uh, a variety of functions. You could uh, use it for check register, manual checks. Uh, you, can, you can see and process payee checks, payroll checks, and also refund checks or, or uh, ACH uh, files can be created from there. So the first one we're going to talk about is the check register. That the check register option will allow you to uh, reissue or print, resequence, reconcile, unreconcile, or auto reconcile checks. And as soon as it pops up, you'll be able to see those options. There they are. Okay. So again, like if you were going to reissue a check, first of all, obviously the, the status would have to be paid. So I could go in here and click on that check and hit the reissue tab. It will ask you for the bank account. If I leave it blank, again, it will take me to the next highest check number available for the selected pay account. And the reissue date would be today's date. I'm going to confirm that. And then it, tell, it told me that reissue check number 90407. And the old check was 90406. So now, here's my new check. You can see that it voided the other check, the initial check. And at this point, if I wanted to print that check out, I could go in and check on the box next to that reissued check that I just processed and click on the print checks option. And again, this will give you a file, whether it be an XML format or PDF format, depending on whatever kind of printing software your district uses. I'll just use a PDF please. And it tells you the file name, and it tells you 
Um, if you want, if you, like I said, if you have a custom form file that, you, that you're using for checks or for direct deposits for checks in this instance, you could actually go in and select that check form file. And then I'm just going to go ahead and click the process payments option. And since I just did the PDF option, it just shows me this. But like I said, depending on what um, printing software they're using, they're probably using XML or the PDF, one or the other. All right. <clears throat> Here. If I needed to resequence some checks, I can do that as well under the check register option. And how I can do that is I could go in and select the checks that I want to resequence. So maybe it's this, 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 and this check. All right. I can click on the resequence tab. And it asked me again for the bank account. The original starting check number, which was 900399, for the ending, which is 90045. And then the new starting check number, I'm going to use 90048. If I wanted to void the old checks, I would just click on that void old checks box. Once I've got this set up, I can put in a void date, which is today's date. I'll just use that. And I can choose the validate option first. Basically, it's going to show me what I'm doing before I actually post it, before I actually do it. So it'll give me a little message telling me that these old check numbers are going to be voided, and these new check numbers are going to be created. And that's exactly what I'm wanting to do. So if that's the case, I could go into the post option. And again, it gives me that same message, kind of telling me this is what it's doing. But then I could go in here, see my check, my new checks were created. And then those other checks were voided. Right here. So they have the capability. And um, to be honest, I think the redesign uh, resequencing works much better than Classic did. Classic always was kind of a little bit of a hassle. So <laughs> um, we also have the capability of reconciling checks or a check if we need to. So in order to reconcile checks, what the district can do is go in and either, if they click, if this box here is going to select everything. Um, if they select the checks that need to be reconciled, they could go in and it, when it changes. <laughs> and then click the reconcile button. It's gonna ask it for the day, it already defaults to the current date, they can change that if they want to. And then just click reconcile. Tells me that five uh, checks were reconciled, one failed reconciled count, and the total amount reconciled was 10,091.58. And then it gave me an error message, but the reason it did it is because it was already voided. So it couldn't reconcile it because it was voided. I had a, one of the checks marked with the check mark. It was already voided. So it won't reconcile that check, which is a good safety measure. It's a good thing. So here are all of the checks that ended up being reconciled then. Now, let's just say, oh, really, I shouldn't have reconciled 407 and 408. Those aren't back yet. I shouldn't have done that. I could go in, select those two, and then just click, click the unreconcile option. 
when I do that, then they're just um, changed back to the paid status, unreconciled. We also have an auto reconcile option. And in order to use the auto reconcile option, the oh, here, we have to have, uh, you can uh, set up the uh, format under utilities. You go to the automatic payment reconciliation option. And then what you're going to do is you're going to basically set up like the, the, the form file that you're going to be using for your auto reconciliation. So you have to tell them whether you want to import uh, the file type as a CSV or a fixed length. And you'll notice here we have two tabs. We have the pay rec, which you're getting the file from the bank and then going in and uploading it using the pay rec. You also have the pay rec extract where you're take, the district is actually going in and taking data from within the system, extracting it, and then they're uploading it to the bank so that they know, hey, these are the outstanding checks that we have sitting out there. So we're in pay rec option right now. So we're gonna leave the CSV format out there. And then what they can do is they can go in and set up the form. Like I said, they probably gonna work with their bank you know, to make sure that they have the formatting set up correctly. But they could go in and maybe the first thing that the bank wants is the check date. And then they need to add, by just clicking on the plus button, they need to add the amount. And then they need to add, mm, let's see, the, the what do we want to do here? Pay account and, oops, here we go. Let's see what else. The boy flag, oops. Okay, so I added four different things. Once I've done that, I'm gonna go in and save this. When I save it, it wants me to name it. So I'm gonna go in and name my pay rack and then I click save. When I do that, then that save format should be loaded up under here under my save format options. If we were creating the pay rec extract option, we're pretty much doing kind of the same thing, a little similar. We're, we're choosing the format type and we have to go in and choose the information that we want on our file. Maybe we want the date and the amount and Payee name. And the payee address to put that on there as well. Okay. All right, so let's just say that this is what we want. Um, here we could go in and, and put in the, the date, the check date. You choose the bank account. You Enter in the payment transaction types that you're trying to pull in, whether it be payroll, deduction, checks, food reduction, or refund of deduction, or if you want all. And then you generate the extract from here. You slide this over so you can see it. Or we can generate a report. So what you're doing, if you're if you're doing the pay rack X rec, you're doing it right out of that utilities option. Here's your report so you can see it. 
So if you're doing the extract every time you're just going in and you're actually running it right out of the utilities automatic payment reconciliation area. But if you're doing the pay rec, you've already set up that the format of the file. So when we're in payments, check register, if you use that, click on that auto reconcile option, it asks you like which format you're wanting to use. And then you would, if you have a file from the bank, obviously you would, you would have to uh, choose the file and then upload that information and be able to use your my pay rec format that you had set up. Any questions on anything under the check register? And again, you'll notice you could filter the grid, you could put things in the grid, whatever you want in there, and you can uh, run a report on the grid, just from the grid as well, if you, if you chose. Maybe you only wanted to pull up anything that was still sitting out there as paid. You could actually do that by pull it, just typing in the status paid and then clicking on report and then just generate a report. Again, whatever format you want to use, you could choose your format and just generate a report, which shows you all of your still outstanding checks that are still sitting out there, not reconciled. So that's another way you can create a report that shows you all that information. Um, then the next option under check register is the manual option. And the manual option will allow you to create a manual check, maybe for, um, maybe you had an employee who had a direct deposit going to checking and savings from the bank sends it back saying, hey, this account for the savings account, that's wrong. So we're sending the $200 back to you. What you could do is use the manual check option to create a check for that particular employee to get the money back, to get the money to him. <clears throat> oh my God, catch up with myself here. So, when we're in the manual option, we have the manual payments option, which if you hit the create feature, it should show you that you have the, the capability of creating an, an employee check, a payee check, or other check. Well, if the, the, the instance that I just gave you, um, the money got, came back from the bank because the account number was wrong, you have $200 saying that you, got, you have to get to this employee, you're going to be using the employee check option because you're going to create a check for $200 to pay this employee. So we have to find that employee and then choose the bank account that you're paying. That basically the bank put the money back in. The check number already defaults. The date defaults to today's date and the dollar amount that we want to pay through this check and then we can add a memo line. You just put in raw account savings. I'll click the save option. So it created Whoops, hold on, click on things I shouldn't be clicking on. It created the check, which went out to the manual payment checks. For $200, it's right here. So what I wanna do is I wanna print that check out. So I just go went to manual payment checks, click on the box next to that payment, click the print checks option, tell it which format I want to use and I process a payment. And then once it creates the XML file, I can then transfer that up to my printing software and print the check out for that employee for that $200 that, that basically the bank sent back. Um, another option in manual payments is the 
Let me go back here. Back to create is the payee check, which would be like for your payroll items, your deduction checks. If you if you needed to correct a check, maybe you process everything through, I was saying payables, but you were like, oh, that is wrong. It should be $50 less. Well, maybe you're making the manual corrections to the employee or whatever on the next pay, but you want this check to be correct. You could go in here, collect payee check, click payee check, then you find the, the payee that you're, you're writing the check to, and then which payroll item it would be for. And then obviously the bank account, you'd have to choose. Check number defaults, as well as the date, and then the amount. So maybe right now the check is, is $1,575, but it needs to only be $1,500. We could create a check for fifteen hundred. Oops, correction for Smith. Maybe we'll just put a little note in here. Oops, maybe if I do, there we go. All right, and then once we do that, we just go ahead and click the save option, and the same thing is going to happen here. We're going to save this. It's going to tell us that the manual check was created successfully. And then in order to get it printed out, we have to go to the manual payment checks. Find the check, which is right here. And print it. Again, XML format, PDF format, whichever the bank or the district uses for their printing and then create the file and then upload it to the printing software and print it out. The last option is called other. And again, we're in manual payments, create. The other might be um, for transferring, maybe they have to transfer money from uh, within, like from payroll to the USAS account. They could use this other check option for that. So they could go in here and then enter the name on the payment. So um, that's district and then the address, and they're writing it to if it's a foreign address, you have to populate that information, which bank account, check number defaults, so does the date and then the dollar amount. So maybe we have to move um, 50 or $75 from the payroll account back over to USAS. We can do that, we can type in a memo and then go ahead and save that. It tells us it created the check. And then we could go ahead and Again, they could print that check out and then deposit that into their USAS account if needed, if so, if so needed. So that is kind of what manual check is, is basically for. It's to basically create a check, um, like hand check in classic. That's what manual check is doing in redesign. Okay. All right, now we'll go back to payments. Our next one is going to be payee. And you'll notice also, but before we get to payee, we do have a resequencing option available in that manual text as well, if that, was, if that would be needed for any purpose. Works the same way as it did in the check register. So just so you know that. Um, the next option, like I said, is going to be the payee option. And we get to that. And here we go. Um, we have three options available. We have payee payments, which is all the payments, whether it be um, electronic or checks. We have the payment checks that we have payment 
electronic transfers. So um, once we're in here, we have the capability of voiding and unvoiding a check when we're in the payee payments option. So let's just say that I needed to void this check right here. I would have to select the check by check, checking the checkbox. Then I would all I need to do is click that void option. And then we avoid a date. Well, there it was. I was like, it didn't. Okay, and so that check was voided. You can see over here now it's got a voided date on a grid of 310. So I actually voided that check. But if I wanted to unvoid it, maybe I messed up and shouldn't have voided it. I easily can go out, select that check again, and click the unvoid option. And maybe I only wanted one of these unvoided. I could do that because it was from two separate payments. I could just go in and unvoid this one. Maybe. There we go. So I only unvoided a portion of that. If I wanted to avoid both, I would just check, I would have checked both of those. Okay, um, the next option, let me see how we were talking about Envoy. We're going to go to the pay payment checks option. This option allows you to reissue the print checks or to resequence checks. So again, if you want to reissue, you would just select a check that has a status of paid and just click the reissue button. You could do that. If you wanted to print that check, you could just select that, that check and then click the print check option. Or if you need to resequence multiple checks, you could select the checks you need to resequence, hit the resequence button. So it's kind of like the same thing that we did back in check register. It's kind of like the same processing. It's just you're processing for different types of payments. Okay. The last option is the payee electronic transfers option. So any electronic transfer that were made to payees are going to be showing in this tab. Um, if for some reason, I know districts had asked for the capability of reconciling electronic transfers, not having them automatically reconcile, the district can actually go in and reconcile the electronic payments by just selecting payment and then sell, selecting the reconcile box or button and the same thing holds true if they wanted to unreconcile they would just check that box of that payment and then click the unreconcile button that would unreconcile that electronic payment so those are the the, the uh, features available under the electronic uh, transfers option All right, let's see here. Again, just keep in mind, you can use this grid if you, uh, there was a certain check number that you needed to find. You could just find, you know, enter in the, that payment number. You could enter that in here and then it would only pull that check up if you wanted it to. So maybe I only want to check the payment number 90549. put in equals 90549, it should only pull up that payment only. So maybe I want to unreconcile that payment. I could just select it and then unreconcile it. That way it narrows it down so that like not every payment is sitting out there on the screen. 
Our next option under payments is the payroll option. And this is going to be all the different, your different either payroll checks or your payroll direct deposits. And you can see we have a payroll payments, which is again, everything, all direct deposits, all checks, everything. Your, we have a direct deposit tab. We have a payroll payments check tab. Okay. And you can see it's kind of the same pattern. We have the same feature. We have a void and an unvoid. We have a print payments checks and direct deposit option here. So if I went in here and I needed to void a check, I could go in oh, once it pulls them up. I could click the void option, or I could click the unvoid option, or I could click the print payment checks and direct deposit op option. This gives me the, the capability of saying, hey, I want to process a check. I want to process, process this as the direct deposit, if it was a direct deposit. What type of format I'm using, the file name automatically gets populated depending on what type of format you use. I choose XML and choose the yeah, check for XML. And then you process your payment. So you could see that you're basically, all of the payment options have pretty much the same features. It's just that you're doing the options for the different types of payments available. We have your direct deposits. And again, when we go into that, we'll see that all we have here is a reissue tab. So if I went in here, I could reissue this direct deposit, just click on that direct deposit, click the reissue, select the bank account, reissue date, and confirm that. And then uh, I'm gonna go in and select that, that check that I wanna, process, I'm going to select print. Do I want it in XML or PDF format? Same option, and then I can just go ahead and print the checks. So you can see, you know, like I said, there's almost like a pattern. You're, you're basically, you have the same options kind of available. It's just different payments. And then the last thing we have is the payroll payment checks. And these are just going to be your physical uh, payroll checks for employees. And the features are the same. We have the reissue, we have the print checks option, we have the resequencing option. So again, if you need to reissue, maybe you reissued it and you need to print it, you could do that. Or you need to resequence a, a number of checks or one check, you can do that. The last option we have under payments is the refund option. And the refund option just shows you uh, the refund payments that have been processed. And then we have the refund checks option and the refund ACH option. So these are all the refunds that were processed through the system. But if um, I need, if I want to go to the refund checks, I could just see the refund checks sitting out there. And then I have the capability of going in. Maybe, maybe uh, this employee, whoops, says an airline was folded. Maybe the employee never got this check. I could reissue this refund here by clicking the check, check mark next to the, the, the check number and clicking reissue. Once I click the reissue, it'll give me a new check number. I can click that and then print the checks. And you can see that I have the capability of resequencing these checks as well. The last option is the refund ACH option. So this would be refunding um, of the ACH direct deposit. So if I wanted to go in and reissue this, I'm gonna go ahead and Click on that box for the direct deposit. If I click the reissue, choose the bank account, reissue date. Oops. Uh, 
and confirm that. Does the same thing. Ask me if I want to print an XML format or PDF format. I can just send that over to my printing software and then submit that to um, my soft printing software. Now, you'll notice here we have the capability to go in here. There's, a, there's an option to generate. Oops, is it working? Hold on here. It's not working right now. But there's an option to generate an ACH submission file for the direct deposit if we wanted to do that, if you wanted to send that file to the bank. Most of the time, districts don't send just like one file because usually the bank makes them, you know, as far as dates and things like that. Uh, so a lot of times they just print checks, but they could generate an ACH file using that option if they chose to do that. I don't know why that's not highlighted. Hmm. Well, anyway, you, you have that capability of doing that as well. Um, let me see. Is there anything else we're going to talk about here? I think that is everything we're going to go over today. Um, so we'll be letting out a little early today. Does anybody have any questions over basically the payroll processing, the payments option, or any of the use as integration options? Are there any questions regarding any of that? Lori, can you yeah. tell me what the difference is between the, optic, the future and the current um, I have a district that's using current, but I would like to have them start using future. Mm -hmm. I need to persuade them. Right. It's, to be honest, it's very nice to be able to use a future option because what they can do is everything they have out there for um, you know time slips or whatever exceptions, all that can be entered in future way before they even initialize, get the payroll started. Then they can run that future pay report. That way it gives them everything that all the exception data right off the bat. You know what I mean? Everything is there, it's already balanced, everything is good. So they don't have to worry about adding any of that in current then. That would be my, you know, that's what I would tell them. It's okay. basically they're being proactive, is what they're being. I mean, they're they're pretty much entering all the exception data, everything in and being able to balance and make sure everything matches up before they even pull it into the current payroll. That's, you know, that's the, the, big, the big thing with it. And then, yeah, say that they have a late time slip come in or whatever, then, yeah, you could get into that in current, that's fine. But as far as like entering everything into current, I would, you're, you, you know, you're kind of defeating the purpose with future being out there and available um, you could already have every, all the exceptions entered in. Everything could be out there. And when you initialize, it's just going to pull all of that in. Okay. And I have one district or a couple of districts that like to run INI Calc first mm -hmm. and yeah. make sure that all their regular um, payments are okay. Yep. Yep. Are balanced. Okay. And then they would delete that payroll and start right. over again. Correct. Like okay. What they could do is they would initialize the payroll, look at their total on the pay report, and, you know, they can verify, you know, everything is accurate based on what was, you know, the, the base payroll last pay. They can make sure, and, you know, if there's differences, normally they know why. And then after they've done that, then they would just go out and delete that payroll totally, just delete it out, and then start adding, adding all of their future data, getting ready for the payroll to process. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. No problem. Any other questions? Okay. If we don't have any other questions, I will see you tomorrow morning at nine o'clock again for our very last session. So have a great day and we'll talk to you later.
Bye.